Hello, uh, my name is Alice Carver Kubik. I am a research scientist here at Image Permanence Institute and I am your presenter for this webinar. So welcome to our first photographic process identification webinar funded by the National Endowment for the Humanities. The purpose of this presentation is to provide you with a starting point for understanding 19th century photographic materials, technologies, and processes. We will discuss basic photographic chemistry and give an overview of photographic materials and processes. Emphasis is placed on how the aesthetic characteristics of a photograph, such as image tone, surface sheen, are directly tied to the technology and materials from which it was made. As we go along, feel free to ask questions um, in the question panel, but we'll wait until the end to answer all of your questions. With the information provided here, you can take a look at some of these really great resources for more information. Um, the first resource listed is an IPI, Image Permanence Institute resource, Graphics Atlas, www.graphicsatlas.org. It's uh, an identification and characterization resource for prints and photographs. We have everything on there from woodcut to inkjet and everything in between. The George Eastman Museum has a great YouTube series on photographic processes. I also want to point you towards Lingua Franca, a new resource by Libraries and Archives Canada. There's a website, but there's also a great iTunes app. So check out those resources. Also, be sure to sign up for our other webinars. We will discuss 20th century and 21st century technologies and materials in October and November. In December, or sorry, in um, January rather and February, we will present a methodology for identification that includes a step-by-step -step approach to identification and a controlled vocabulary specific to identifying characteristics of photographs. So let's get started. What is a photograph? Let's define it. Photography comes from the Greek. It means writing with light. The notion of what a photograph is changes in the 21st century with digital technology, but for our purposes in discussing 19th century photographs, we'll keep it simple. A photograph is an image created through the use of light sensitive chemical compounds, and that image is on a substrate. In the 19th century, we have three light sensitive chemical compounds. We have silver salts, iron salts, and chromium salts. And just as a side note, the term salt is a term used in chemistry to describe an ionic compound made up of two oppositely charged ions, so a positive and negative ion. So first I want to start by introducing you to the materials used to make photographs as just sort of an overview of the materials. The simplest photographs in terms of structure are those with just a substrate and the image material. Some photographs also have a binder which holds the image, and some prints, the support is coated with an additional coating. So image material. Most 19th century photographic processes are silver-based. Most silver-based prints, the image is composed of both silver and gold. In other processes, the image material is another metal, like platinum, and some other processes, the image material is actually pigment. The image material, the size, the shape, the type of material, drives image color or tone. The appearance of the image at the microscopic level is a function of how the image was formed. So understanding image formation and what the image material is, is really helpful in process identification. The most common support is paper. Uh, 19th century photographs are also found on metal and glass. Less common, but definitely found in collections, are cloth supports, ceramic, and leather. Again, the simplest photographic structure has just image material and a support. Some photographs have a binder, which is coated onto the substrate and holds the image material above the substrate, producing a sharper image. Common binder materials are albumin, which is egg whites, collodion, and gelatin.
Again, some photographs have an additional layer called a barita layer. Barita is the pigment, barium sulfate, it's a white pigment, uh, and it's mixed in with gelatin, which is then coated onto the support to create a really smooth surface. The binder is then coated on top of the barita. So to review, one layer photographs have just image material and a support. Some photographs are two layers, which include a support and a binder with the image in the binder. Other photographs have three layers in which the barita is coated onto the support and the binder holding the image material is then on top of the barita. This idea of layer structure is important in discussing 19th century photographic prints. These different configurations result in different visual characteristics which we use for identification. In most collections, you will encounter four different types of photographs. There are negatives, there are prints, there are positive transparencies, and there are direct positives. So a negative is a tonally reversed image on a transparent support. So how do we make a negative? What is the negative? The inventors of photography, of which there are many, had a common goal to permanently fix the image in the camera obscura using chemistry. The camera obscura was an optical device used as a drawing aid. A camera can be as simple as a box with a hole in it, or it can be more complex, having a lens, shutter to control exposure, bellows to control focus, and so on. So let's discuss how does the camera work. Light, reflecting off the subject, enters the camera through the lens. Values of light, seen as an image are projected onto the light sensitive photographic material in the camera, but the image is upside down and backwards. The exposed photographic material produces a tonally reversed image, meaning the light areas of the scene appear dark and the dark areas appear light. So let's this, discuss this image here. The man in this picture has a light colored shirt. White is reflective, and so the light is bouncing off of the white, it's entering into the camera, and it's exposing the photographic material in the camera. So the, so the areas in the camera that correspond with the light are being exposed, and they're, and they're dark. However, his hair is dark, it's absorbing a lot of light and not reflecting much at all, so you can see the image in the camera, his hair is actually white because there's really no exposure happening there. A print is usually made from the negative and it's a positive image on an opaque support. A positive transparency is a positive image on a transparent support. In the 19th century, these are also commonly called lantern slides. And they're meant to be projected. So anytime we put light sensitive material in a camera and expose it, a negative image is produced. So in the 19th century, we also have these objects, what we call direct positives, a positive image made directly in camera. However, direct positives are all technically negatives. They're just made to appear positive through a variety of means. Our direct positives in the 19th century include daguerreotypes, amber types, and tintypes. Amber types in Europe are also referred to as collodion positives on glass, and tintypes are also sometimes called ferrotypes. Okay, so let's talk chemistry. Let's talk about image formation. Don't panic. Um, I'm going to walk you through it, and I'm going to keep it um, relatively simple. The goal here is to help you understand the basics of silver image formation and how the way the images form impacts fo a photograph's visual characteristics. So in the 19th century, um, there are two kinds of silver chemistry. There's developing out chemistry, which is used for negatives and some direct positives, and there's printing out chemistry, which is used to make prints. So what you see here is the periodic table of elements. Hopefully this is familiar to most of you. The arrow on the left is pointing towards silver. That's our first sort of element that we need for, for photography, for silver-based photography. The arrow on the right is pointing, is pointing towards the halogens. 
These are chlorine, bromine, and iodine. So notice that the halogens are all in the same column in the periodic table. That means they share some chemical traits, and they can actually be interchangeable in silver chemistry. When these elements um, are in their ionic state, ionic state and combined with another element, usually a metal, they form a compound and they gain the suffix "-ide", so we call them chloride, bromide, iodide, and together we call them halides. Sometimes we also refer to them as salts. So silver-based photography begins with pure silver, which is dissolved in nitric acid, giving us a compound called silver nitrate. Silver nitrate usually wasn't made by the photographer, it was something that was purchased. And you can purchase silver nitrate today. The silver nitrate is aqueous or a liquid, and so it's in solution. It's combined with the halide. In this case, we're going to use sodium chloride, which is also in solution in liquid form. Sodium chloride is just common table salt. When we combine these two liquids together, a precipitate or solid forms called silver chloride. Silver chloride is light sensitive. So chemistry is kind of like a middle school dance. Some elements like to dance with each other and some like to watch from the safety of the wall. The sodium and the nitrate are spectators. They're not involved in the reaction. The important chemical, chemical dance is between the silver and the chloride. If you're familiar with West Side Story, we can think of the silver and chloride like Tony and Maria. Their eyes meet and they're magically drawn together and, um, and that bond is formed. So again, that reaction is the same with each of the halides. Instead of using sodium chloride, we can use potassium bromide or potassium iodide. They're all interchangeable and they're all light sensitive. So here is the electromagnetic spectrum. Silver halides are only sensitive to ultraviolet light and the blue light of the visible part of the spectrum. This is why in the 19th century, when you photograph a landscape, you couldn't photograph the landscape and the sky at the same time. They required different exposures. You could either photograph clouds or you could photograph the scene. And so a lot of landscapes are blanked out because you just couldn't get the information in there. This is also why in portraiture, if you were to photograph somebody in a red dress, their red dress would actually appear black. Or if someone has freckles, those freckles appear as sort of black spots on their face. I have freckles. I don't photograph particularly well with 19th century processes. So let's start by discussing how a negative is made because this uses developing out chemistry. Developing out um, is sometimes shortened to DOP, developing out process, or developing out print in some cases. So in developing out chemistry, the ratio of silver to halide differ from printing out chemistry. In developing out chemistry, we have more halide than silver. We we'll only require short exposure time, and a latent or invisible image is formed. The silver halide, this latent image, is reduced to silver image, a visible silver image, through the use of a chemical solution. And these silver image particles are relatively large. So the silver halide is, is a crystal. Here are four representations of a silver halide. I will use these in my illustrations discussing silver image formation. So on the far left, we have a three-dimensional model showing silver and bromide ions bonded together. And again, you can see that it, it forms this sort of three-dimensional crystal. Next to that is a 2D model. So if you took this three-dimensional crystal and you made it two dimensions, we would have um, what we see here. The large circles are the bromide ions and the small ones are the silver ions. The next image is from a scanning electron microscope and it shows actual silver bromide crystals. And you can see, you can't see the individual atoms, so the other two are showing sort of the individual atoms. Here's what the crystal actually looks like. We can't see the individual atoms, they're far too small, but we can see that it's this hexagonal shape, this crystal shape. And finally, we have an illustration of a silver bromide crystal.
So we start by coating the substrate with the light sensitive silver halides. In some processes, the silver halides are coated directly onto paper, and in other processes, they are in a binder like collodion and coated on glass or metal. During exposure in the camera, a latent image is formed. This light sensitive material that we've coated is then placed in a developer bath which converts the exposed silver halides to metallic silver image particles. The object is still light sensitive so then it needs to be fixed. It's fixed in a, in a chemical called sodium thiosulfate and what this does is it breaks up those unexposed silver halides which are then removed through just washing them in water. So what exactly is happening when the latent image is formed during develop and, and what is happening during development? Silver halide chemistry is what's called an oxidation reduction reaction. So if we remember from our high school chemistry or our college chemistry, the structure of an atom includes protons, neutrons, and electrons. The nucleus is made up of protons and neutrons and they're locked down. They can't go anywhere. The nucleus is surrounded by electrons, and the electrons can move about. Electrons have a negative charge to them. So an oxidation reduction reaction has to do with the movement of the electrons. If an atom loses an electron, it's oxidized, and if it gains an electron, it's reduced. We can remember it by saying Leo says Ger. Lose electron oxidize, gain electron reduced. And so silver image formation is a chemical reaction. Chemical reactions often need energy to push them forward, to make them go. In this case, we need energy in the form of light to push our reaction forward. So energy in the form of photons of light excite electrons in the silver halide crystal. This bounces the electrons out of orbit. Think of it like a bouncy ball. Your arm is the energy, the ball is the electron, you throw the ball against the ground, it bounces up into the air, but instead of coming back down, the electron gets stuck in these little imperfections in the crystal. Again, these electrons have a negative charge to them. The silver ions have a positive charge, so these positively charged silver ions are attracted to the negatively charged electrons. The silver moves over to this spot where it's stuck, and it grabs that electron, it gains an electron, so it's reduced to a silver atom. This only takes a short exposure to light to get this started. In the 19th century, a short exposure means several seconds up to a minute, depending on the quality of light and how light sensitive the silver halide was. However, it still needs more electrons to reduce enough of these silver, these silver ions to silver image to silver atoms in order to make a visible silver image particle. So what I, want to, what I want to do is just walk you through this diagram here. So what we have in the first box is this little squiggle line is energy. It's, it's light, the photons of light. And it's bouncing an electron off of the bromide. And the next box, here's our little defect in our crystal. And so that electron is getting stuck there our little silver ion is then attracted to that negative charge where it grabs the electron and it becomes a full-fledged silver atom. This just keeps going with exposure to light until you get a little cluster of maybe four or five silver atoms. You cannot see four or five silver atoms, but the process has begun. We have planted the seed for a visible image particle. We just need to keep this reaction going. But there's not enough in there to keep the reaction going. So what we need are more electrons. The developer is an electron source. Most developers in the 19th century include, included another metal as an electron source. Often it was actually a little bit of silver nitrate as well as other things in this solution. Um, so basically, we're providing electrons so we can just keep the process going. We can keep the party going until we have 
a visible silver image particle. This is what we call physical development. And so again, this is this diagram shows the same thing we saw on the previous slide. It's just different, just showing it differently. This yellow squiggle is our light energy. The balls with the minus sign, that's our electron. The light energy is bouncing the electron out of orbit. It's getting stuck in a defect in the crystal. The silver ions migrate to that negatively charged electron and form a silver atom. And as we add developer, those electrons for the developer are attracted to that same spot. And more and more silver keeps going there until we have a silver image particle. So when you put your, your exposed material into the developer bath, this is what happens. You see the image appear. It goes from an invisible image to a visible image because that developer is just feeding it electrons. Silver developing out processes in the 19th century include paper negatives. These are two layer structures, so the silver halide is coated directly onto paper. Sometimes that paper is oiled or waxed to make it more transparent. The silver image particles are relatively large, so we get a neutral sort of black image tone. The wet collodion process can produce uh, a negative or a positive transparency. So the way this goes is you put the salt or the halide, iodide or bromide, into collodion. The collodion is poured onto a glass plate. It's dipped into the silver nitrate where that chemical dance happens and we get our silver halide forming in the collodion. That plate is then taken out of the silver nitrate bath and put into the camera and exposed. The entire process has to be done while still wet, hence the term wet plate collodion. Wet plate collodion can also use, be used to make direct positives, the amber type and the tin type. Again, all direct positives are technically negatives, so amber types and tin types are actually underexposed negatives which are made to appear positive by putting black behind it. In the case of the amber type, you can put a black lacquer or it can be um, anything, a black piece of cloth or paper. Um, I found all sorts of things um, behind amber types. A tin type is essentially the same. The only difference is the support. It's a lacquered, a black lacquered iron support. The gelatin dry plate can also be used to make negatives or positive transparencies. This process was introduced in the late 19th century and it replaced the wet collodion process. Dry plates were manufactured and purchased, so the practitioner wasn't necessarily making these. They were buying these already sensitized and ready to go. Okay. So that's, that's pretty much it with our developing out chemistry. I want to change gears here and talk about the daguerreotype. I'm not, you can tell I'm not going in chronological order. The daguerreotype was actually the first photographic process or one of the first photographic processes. It was introduced in 1839 and it really stands alone as a process in terms of the materials and the chemistry. But I wanted to sort of discuss basic silver halide chemistry before we, we tackle the daguerreotype. The daguerreotype consists of a copper plate which is plated with pure silver. It's, it's polished to a mirror shine and then exposed to the fumes of halogen crystals. So they're not in their ionic state, they're actually the halogen crystals. And with these fumes, they sort of rise up and, and attach themselves to the pure silver and this is how we get our silver halide. This, is then, this plate is then exposed in the camera and it produces a latent image. Again, a short exposure. You get an invisible latent image. But the developer isn't your sort of typical developing bath. It's actually developed with fumes of mercury. Um, Daguerre, who invented this process, didn't really understand exactly what was happening chemically. And 
Um, we don't really 100% understand it now. We know that the mercury forms an amalgam with the silver, but what exactly is happening isn't clear. But somehow the mercury draws those exposed silver image particles to the surface, and we get our silver image. The daguerreotype was also um, treated with, with a gold chloride solution. Um, this gave it a little more contrast and actually made it so that the silver image particles were better attached to the plate, um, sort of stuck better. Um, again, the daguerreotype is a direct positive and it's technically a negative, so depending on the viewing angle, it appears as a negative or a positive. And because it has this highly reflected mirrored surface, um, it's reflective. So this image here on the right, you could see um, a reflection in the, in the plate itself. So now I want to turn our attention to photographic prints. Again, the print is usually made from the negative and it's a positive image on an opaque support. Nineteenth century silver-based prints are all printed out. The silver halide is reduced to silver image by exposure to light alone. There is no, develop, develop, no development necessary. The ratio of the silver to halide includes an excess of silver, so you have more silver ions than you have halide ions. This it produces um, a really small round image particle, which in turn gives us a really warm image tone. So here are our printed out processes and dates. Again, these are all prints, so they all have a paper support. All printed out papers are chemically essentially the same. The silver halide is reduced by light energy to produce an image. The way they differ is in um, the materials and in their layer structures. So before we talk about the materials, I want to talk about um, the chemistry of printing out processes. The negative is placed in direct contact with the sensitized paper and exposed to light. Again, there are more silver ions than halide ions present, and so the beginning of the exposure, the light exposure, is the same as we saw before, as we see in this diagram. The photons of light bounce an electron off of the halide. It gets stuck in this imperfection in the crystal. The silver ions are attracted to that negative electron, forming a silver atom. And the process just keeps happening with light exposure. In this case, because we have the excess of silver, we have a ton of silver in this, we have enough silver ions to keep, keep it going. It just keeps going until we get enough silver atoms that we have a visible image particle. So when you remove the negative, you have a visible print. You can watch the image form as it prints. The printed out silver image particles are really small, and these small particles produce a reddish or sort of red-orange, really kind of a brick red image color. In the 19th century, um, and I would say even today, this brick red image color isn't particularly pleasing. So printed out prints are then toned to produce a more pleasing tone. After toning, they're fixed to remove all of those unexposed silver halides and then washed. Very early salted paper prints were toned with sulfur or a combination of gold chloride and sulfur. These prints tended to have stability issues, and these stability issues were recognized in the 19th century in the 1850s. So by the mid-1850s, most printed out prints were toned with gold chloride alone. This includes salted paper prints, albumin prints, gelatin printed out prints, and collodion printed out prints. So what's happening in the toning solution is that some of the gold in the gold chloride replaces some of the silver. Gold 
and silver are what we call noble metals. And gold just happens to be more noble than silver. And so what happens is the gold ion actually grabs an electron off of the silver. So you, you end up with a gold image particle instead of a silver image particle. So the gold is literally replacing some of the silver. The image tone ranges from a purple red to this near purple black. And the tone depends on the length of time that the paper is in the toning solution and the strength of the gold chlor chloride toning solution. And so this albumin print on the end is really strongly toned. There's a lot of gold in there um, compared to the silver. And that gives us this sort of purple black image tone. Whereas the collodion POP, the gelatin POP on the other side, just happened to have um, a weaker toning sol tonering um, solution, so maybe a weaker gold chloride, gold chloride solution, they weren't in there as long, and so they lean more towards a sort of purple red image color. And so 19th century printed out prints do have this range, and it really depends on the length and the strength of the toning bath, how much gold replaced the silver. The exception with printing out prints is the matte collodion print. The matte collodion print, um, they were introduced in the 1890s, um, and these prints were toned with gold or platinum or a combination of gold and platinum. So if they're toned with just gold, they have these sort of purple image tones. If they're toned with just platinum, they have brown image tones. If they're toned with a combination of gold and platinum, you get these sort of warm black, almost a green black image tone. Um, and there's also sort of subtleties in between all of these, just depending on how much platinum and how much gold might have been in the toner, in the toning solution. All printed out prints are susceptible to image fading, as well as a change in image tone from that sort of reddish, red brown or um, red purple tone uh, to brown, yellow, or yellow green. This is due also to an oxidation reduction reaction. So that silver image particle can actually be oxidized. It can lose an electron um, through environmental pollutants, all sorts of things. Um, so if you lose that electron, uh, the silver ion is free to move about. And sometimes it does reduce back to a silver image particle, but that new silver image particle, that re-reduced image particle, if you will, um, is smaller. And that smaller particle um, actually gives you these sort of brown image tones. And so here in this stereo card, um, what we have is the silver around the edges has been oxidized and then reduced back into smaller image particles. Or the oxidized image particle might get attacked by sulfur. That sulfur can come from pollutants in the air or it can come from um, within the print if it wasn't washed properly after fixing. And that's the case here, where we end up with silver sulfide, which is this kind of yellow, yellow-green image color. So again, while the chemistry of all silver printed out prints is similar, resulting in similar image tones, the rest of the image materials differ. Salted paper prints have a one-layer structure, Silver halides are applied directly to this paper support, so the image forms in the paper. So here we have the one layer support. Here is the cross section. So we've actually taken a little sliver of the print and imaged it with magnification. We have the paper support, and you can see the silver image forms within the paper support, giving us a relatively soft image in terms of image quality. An albumin print has a two-layer structure. The halide is added to the egg white, which is beaten to a froth and then coated onto the paper support. The silver nitrate is then applied to that albumin layer. We get the chemical dance. We form a light-sensitive silver halide. So the image actually forms within that albumin layer. So in this cross-section, we can see the paper support. We can see a very thin layer of albumin on top of the paper, and the image is here in the albumin. The albumin print also has a sharper image because the image is suspended above the paper rather than being in the paper. 
Gelatin and collodion printed out prints have a paper support, which is coated with a bridal layer. Again, that pigment mixed in with gelatin and coated onto the paper. And then the binder is on, on top of that, and the silver halides are in the binder. And the image forms in the binder. The only major difference between these two types of prints is the material used for the binder. It's either gelatin or collodion. So the image forms in the gelatin or collodion layer, which is here on top of the barita, which is on top of the paper. Each material used as a binder has specific properties. Albumin yellows, all historic albumin prints have yellow highlights. The best way to see the yellow is to hold the print up to a bright white piece of paper and you will see that they're yellow. Collodion sometimes, but not always, has a glossy shirt surface sheen, but that gloss has iridescent colors when viewed under fluorescent lighting. So in the second image, you can see the sort of pink and green iridescence in the gloss. Gelatin is um, really hygroscopic. It's much more hygroscopic than collodion, so as a result, it's more susceptible to silver image deterioration. So gelatin swells in a humid environment, allowing, allowing pollutants to more easily penetrate that gelatin binder and attack the silver image. So as a review, here are the three basic layer structures for printed out prints. There's the one layer print, the two layer print, and the three layer print. The different layer structures produce different surface characteristics. The one layer print is matte, a two layer print can be semi-matte, and three layer prints tend to be glossy. So there you go, salted paper prints without any additional surface coatings are matte. Albumin prints from the 1850s and 1860s tend to be semi-matte. Collodion gelatin printed out prints are glossy. Matte collodion prints, on the other hand, have a bridal layer, but they have a very, very thin bridal layer, or they just have a layer of clear hardened gelatin. I've seen both. This layer is necessary for the collodion to stick to the paper. However, it's so thin that the paper fibers protrude, producing a rough surface and therefore a semi-matte surface sheen. Also, later albumin prints from the 1880s and 1890s tend to be glossy. This is just a change in aesthetic preferences for glossier surfaces in the 1880s and 1890s. There's several ways in which the gloss could be heightened. Um, if you'd like to learn more about that, look at www.graphicsatlas.org and it'll talk about all the ways that albumin prints can be made more glossy. The different layer structures also influence visual characteristics seen with magnification. Salted paper prints have paper fibers that are clearly visible. The image is in the paper support. Albumin prints and matte collodion prints will have paper fibers that are visible and the image is suspended above the paper support. Collodion and gelatin printed out prints, the paper fibers are obscured. The image particles in all silver printed out prints are so small that they're not really readily visible with magnification, and so they're continuous in tone when viewed with magnification. So just to put it all together, in the next few slides, I'm just going to show the key identifying features or key identifying characteristics for each of the printing out processes. Salted paper prints are purple red in tone because they're printed out. They have a matte surface sheen because of that one layer structure. They're continuous in tone, and also because of that one layer structure, the paper fibers are visible and the image is in the paper support. Albumin prints have a similar image tone. They're purple, red, and image tone. Because they have that albumin binder, they're semi-matte or glossy. They're continuous in tone. You'll see the paper fibers, but you'll see it through the albumin layer, and you'll see that the image is actually above the paper support in that albumin layer. Collodion printed out prints have the same image tone, purple red. They're glossy. Sometimes, but not always, they have that iridescence in the gloss. They're continuous in tone, and the paper fibers are obscured. 
gelatin printed out prints have very similar characteristics. They're purple red, they're glossy and surface sheen, they're continuous in tone, and the paper fibers are obscured by that varietal layer. Matte collodion prints will range from purple red, brown, to almost a neutral black. They're almost always semi-matte. They're continuous in tone. You'll see paper fibers, but again, through the binder, and the image will be above the paper, paper fibers. So there's another class of 19th century photographic prints, but based on the light sensitivity of chromium. So if you remember when we defined what a photograph is, I mentioned that there's silver salt, chromium salts, and iron salts. So chromium, specifically a chromium compound called a dichromate, is light sensitive if you mix it in with certain colloids, like gelatin or gum arabic. So here are our dichromated um, colloid processes, the carbon print. Um, this is the most common of the dichromatic colloids processes in the 19th century, and this is the one that I'm going to discuss and focus on. Direct carbon, commonly known as the Fresson process, is a relative of the carbon process. And gum dichromate, or commonly known as gum bichromate, is also based on light sensitivity of, of chromium and uses gum arabic as a binder. If you're interested in learning more about the direct carbon and the gum dichromate, Look at the identification pages on Graphics Atlas. I also want to note that most photomechanical printing processes are also based on the light sensitivity of chromium. So dichromated colloid chemistry is a bit more complex than silver chemistry. So here's a simplified version. When a substance like gelatin or gum arabic is treated with a chromium compound called the dichromate, it becomes light sensitive. The gelatin hardens where it's exposed to light and remains water soluble where it's not exposed to light. Gelatin is water soluble, so the unexposed areas um, are washed away. This results in an image in low relief. The gelatin itself is colorless, so in order to have a visible image, pigment is added to the gelatin. So therefore, when we talk about our image materials, uh, the image is pigment, the gelatin, there's a gelatin binder, which is coated onto a paper support. So those are our materials, pigment in gelatin on paper. Because of the way in which the image forms where part of it hardens, where it's exposed to light, and the parts that aren't exposed are water soluble, you get that low relief, what we get is something called differential gloss. This is um, because in the shadows where the gelatin is thickest, we get a higher gloss than the highlights where the gelatin is very thin. You're almost basically down to the paper support in the highlights. Also, because pigment particles are used as a colorant, the pigment particles themselves are visible under magnification. The pigment image is pretty stable, so carbon prints relatively, um, or sorry, rarely exhibit any image fading. So finally, the cyanotype and platinum processes are based on the light sensitivity of iron. In the cyanotype process, ammonium ferric citrate and potassium ferrocyanide are combined and coated onto paper. The conversion of these two compounds to the pigment Prussian blue or ferric ferrocyanide is a complex two-step process and involves the exposure to ultraviolet light. The term ferric means iron. Um, so what we have is a one-layer structure because those chemicals are coated directly onto the paper, the image forms directly within the paper. Cyanotypes can also be found on cloth. They have a matte surface sheen, they're continuous in tone, and because they're a one layer structure, the paper fibers are clearly visible and the image is in the paper support. Another key identifying feature is they're blue. Cyanotypes can be toned to other colors. Um, I honestly don't know how common that is. and um, 
I wouldn't really know. I wouldn't really be able to tell and I, without um, some kind of analytical tool. So the chemistry of the platinum process is a pretty complicated chain reaction. Iron salts and platinum salts are applied to a paper support through exposure to light and then into a chemical developing bath. The platinum salts are reduced to pure platinum metal, forming the final image within the paper support. Um, for a deeper discussion of the chemistry of this, I recommend reading the identification page on Graphics Atlas. Chemical additives and or the use of hot developer produce warm brown image tones, cold or really room temperature developer, and no additives typically produce sort of neutral black image tones. There are other additives that are found in the, liter in the literature that can produce a wide range of image colors from red to blue to green. Again, I don't know how common uh, using those chemicals was. Um, what I can tell you is these brown image tones are fairly common and these neutral black image tones are fairly common. Again, the light sensitive chemicals are coated directly onto the paper support and so we have a one layer structure which produces a matte surface sheen, the image is continuous in tone, and the papers, paper fibers are clearly visible um, and the image is sort of within the paper support. So that concludes the content for the webinar. Thank you very much for coming, for attending. Um, again, this webinar is made possible through a grant for the National, from the National Endowment for the Humanities, and I want to thank them. I also want to thank the Andrew w. w. Mellon Foundation. We received grants from the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation to build the content for Graphics Atlas. So much of the information that was presented to you today is based on what I learned um, through building content for Graphics Atlas. Um, so I want to remind you to sign up for our next webinar, October 11th at 2 p.m. Eastern Time. It will be on 20th Century Materials and Technologies. Um, I'd like to invite you to ask some questions and I will try my best to answer them. And at the conclusion, uh, a brief survey will pop up on your screen and I would love it if you would take the survey and give us some feedback on how we did as we look forward to our next webinar next month. Okay, so the first question I have is, at what level were 19th century photographers aware of the chemical reactions? Yeah, that's a good question. So, one of the, we, I, I should also mention that we have um, a series of workshops that we're giving. Um, so, in the workshops, I do address this more directly. Um, so, the discovery of 19th century chemicals that are used for um, silver halide chemistry. So basically silver halide chemistry, the halides weren't really discovered, fully discovered until the early 19th century. Um, and it wasn't, and so it wasn't until sort of early 19th century that there was this awareness that um, if you put silver nitrate and you combined it with the halide that you get a light sensitive compound. But as soon as people were aware of this, they began to experiment. And so our, some of our first recorded experiments are um, by um, Humphrey Davy and, oh man, my brain is fried now. Um, somebody help me out here, the pottery guy. Anyway, um, so these, these two guys were working with photographic chemistry, but they had the problem that they couldn't fix it. Um, they couldn't render it on light sensitive. And Wedgwood, thank you. Zach Fox, thank you. Wedgwood and Davy, Josiah Wedgwood, thank you. Um, I'm going a little brain dead at this point. So the Wedgwood and Davy are trying to figure out the chemistry, but they can't fix it. And um, our first inventors of photography, Daguerre, also couldn't figure out how to fix it, and neither could Talbot. Um, it was John Herschel who figured out how to, how to fix um, the, the, the photograph. So he had figured out like 20 years earlier, 
um, that sodium thiosulfate, which he called hyposulfate of soda, um, would actually break apart that silver halide. But at the time that he figured it out, no one had any real use for it. Um, so they were so they were actually aware of what was happening chemically um, as early as I would say probably the 1820s, 1830s. Um, but it wasn't until sort of 1839 when it all came together and you add Herschel to the mix that we actually have photography. Now, how deeply did they understand the chemical reaction? Um, I can't say, maybe someone else can. Um, I can tell you that in terms of silver halide chemistry, um, I was just talking with my colleague, Doug Nishimura. He's a chemist. Um, he works with us here at IPI. And, you know, he stated that, you know, what's happening chemically, a lot of it is educated guess. And that's a lot of chemistry. What, what, what we think is happening is an educated guess. Um, we, where we think the electrons are going is an educated guess. All we know is that, the, that these reactions are working and they're happening, and we have a pretty good idea of how they're working. So hopefully that answers your question. Um, so the next question is, would viewing the image as a cross-section with magnifying glass help me determine the number of layers? Um, that's a good question. So our cross-sections are made um, by cutting up the photograph into little pieces. So it's a destructive technique. I would not recommend cutting up your photographs. What we do is we take a little sliver out of the photograph and we use a special tool called a microtome that cuts um, a little sliver off of the end of it. Uh, we then, um, it's, and the slivers are between two and 10 um, microns. We then put it onto a slide and we um, put it under the microscope and we image it at about 200 times magnification, which gives us an idea of what the layer structures are. Um, I would encourage you to um, attend our uh, webinars that discuss the methodology for looking and um, and because in that point we'll also discuss how do you look at a photograph for layer structure. But I'll just go about it really quickly. When you're looking at a photograph with magnification, you can use a loop or you can use a pocket microscope or if you're so lucky, use a microscope. And set up your light source so that's a raking light. It's coming from the side across the surface. And what that'll do is it'll emphasize the paper fibers. And so it, if you have a one layer or two layer structure in which the paper fibers are visible, that raking light will make those paper fibers sort of pop. And at that point with the magnification, you'll be able to see the paper fibers and hopefully you'll be able to make that determination of whether or not the image is in the paper support or if it's floating above. Another way that you can look at it is look at the edges of the print, at the corners, at the edges, where the print might have had some damage. And in that way, you may actually see if those layers, the binder or the binder and the barita, are lifting or have been removed. You might actually be able to see those layers and distinguish them. So hopefully that's helpful. Okay, what does continuous in tone mean? Great question. So um, what, I, what I want you to do is I want you to visit www.graphicsatlas.org and I want you to go to the compare module. And I want you to pick um, an object under the photomechanical section. How about letterpress halftone? And I want you to compare it to an albumin print with magnification. You will notice that the letter, letterpress halftone, the image is made up of dots. That's what we call a patterned image. It's made up of dots. Whereas in your albumin print, you don't see any, you don't see anything. The, whole, the image is continuous. You don't see any image, you don't see a structure to the image. There's no dots. If you look at some of the other photomechanical processes or some of the digital processes, you're going to see dots, squares, squiggles. So that's what, that would, that's what we call patterned image. Versus your true photographs, most of those images are what we're going to call continuous in tone. Okay, next question. Is it safe to assume that the image in all silver-based negatives is developed chemically? Uh, yeah, I would say so, and here's why. Um, in the very beginning, Talbot um, was experimenting with his photographic chemistry, um, and he was using the chemistry that has that excess of, of halide to salt, 
and he was using chemistry that had the excess of salt to halide. And so, you know, what he found was with that excess of halide to salt, or, or sorry, excess to halide to silver, you could do that short exposure uh, in camera and then develop it out. Um, he did try it with, you can, I mean, you can maybe eventually get an in-camera image um, with printing out chemistry, although it would take a really, really, really long time. The advantage of developing out chemistry is the short exposure. So you can do portraiture, you can capture people. Again, we're talking exposure of like several seconds. That's why people had to sit really, really still for, for portraits in the 19th century. Um, but yeah, I would assume that negatives are developed out and physically developed in the 19th century. Um, I will say that almost all silver-based prints are printed out in the 19th century with the exception of prints made by Blancourt of Vard. He was a French fellow that um, had his own printing firm and he was actually using developing out chemistry to use prints, but you will know that they are developed out because they're going to have neutral black image tones and they'll have been printed by Blink Carter Vard and he only printed for specific pro photographers like Gustave Le Gray, Henri Lesec, and so on. Okay, the next question is, should I identify the process? Does this change how they are preserved? Yes, it does. Um, so, when we talk about preservation for 19th century photographs, um, for the most part, we'll treat them very similarly. You'll want them to be in um, a cool environment with a moderate relative humidity. Um, I believe our last webinar we talk about preservation. Um, but cool environment, um, moderate relative humidity, you'll want to store them in housing materials that are photo safe, so they've passed the photographic activity test as well as some other tests. Um, in some cases, there's some research out there and some data that, that, just, that say for some processes you should use buffered versus unbuffered or don't use buffered for this process. Um, the, the truth is um, that needs to be studied a, a little bit better. I say when in doubt, um, err on the side of caution and use unbuffered materials, although um, you know the buffering agent probably isn't going to harm your photographs. Um, for example, the cyanotype, um, an alkaline solution will harm the photograph. It'll cause that sort of blue image material, cause that pigment to sort of be destroyed. Um, however, it's only if it's wet. And so the buffering agent in your buffered materials is actually a particulate. So if your collection is in a hot flood, um, your cyanotypes are in trouble. Um, if your collection is in a hot flood, you're in trouble anyway. Um, so, you know, I would say err on the side of caution, but um, for the most part, you know, our preservation, we're going to treat, we're going to treat most of these objects similarly. However, when it comes to conservation and conservation treatment, knowing the process does make a big difference. For example, the collodion binder versus the gelatin binder. A collodion binder will dissolve in most solvents like acetone, whereas the gelatin won't. Okay, next question. At what point do we distinguish a photographic image produced via halftones as a photograph as opposed to a print? Um, so I want also I want you to also visit Graphics Atlas and look at the different types of photographs or the types of printed images we have. We have what we call the pre-photographic prints, which are prints made through traditional printmaking techniques etchings, engravings, and so on. We have our photomechanical processes, we have our true photographs, and we have our digital processes. The photomechanical processes and most digital processes, what we see are images produced via halftones. And it's just the technology. How does the image get there? Um, with photomechanical, and you know, inevitably we're using a marriage between photography and um, these traditional printmaking techniques, um, but, but with traditional printmaking techniques, you could have ink or no ink, and so we have to break up that image into what we call halftones, which are so small that your eye sort of 
blends it together. Um, and our digital output processes like inkjet are working on the same theory. An inkjet print can give you ink or no ink. So what we are, what what is produced are teeny tiny dots, which are really close together, and your eye blends it together to produce a continuous and tone image, kind of on the macro level. On the micro level, with our photomechanical and with our inkjet, you're going to see dots. Um, and so that's how you distinguish a true photographic image versus something produced with half tones, is you have to use magnification. You'll have dots or you won't have dots. Or in some cases, photomechanical, you'll have squiggles or something else. But again, look at Graphics Atlas, look at the magnification views to see what those look like. Okay, so um, it's almost three. Um, or it is three, so that is pretty much all we have time for. Those of you who have asked questions that we haven't had time to answer, we know who you are and um, we know how to find you, so we will email you and try to answer your unanswered questions um, in due time. So um, thank you very much again for attending. I look forward to uh, you know virtually seeing you all in next month. <laughs>